but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, you know, if uh, other people join in, I know that uh, they'll be able to pick it up. So again, my name is Ron. I'm a commercial real estate attorney here in Dallas. Uh, I practice primarily on acquisitions, dispositions, and leasing matters um, regarding all types of property types. Uh, retail is obviously a very popular topic. Um, what I'm going to do is walk through a, a quick PowerPoint that um, kind of describes the issues and the process that we're facing with, um, with our clients. So let me share my screen and, and I want this to be very interactive. You know, we have kind of a, a small group today. I know it's Friday afternoon. I was trying to get this content scheduled and, and produced as quick as I could, but uh, feel free to interrupt, you know, use your video, use the chat function, just interrupt me with questions and I want to make it as useful for you guys individually as it can be. So, all right. So, um, COVID-19, uh, you know, I think this is something everybody has heard about commercial real estate. Um, again, my name is Ron. I'm an attorney. I also happen to be, uh, personally invested in a couple of commercial real estate deals. I think that gives me an interesting background where I understand what my clients are evaluating and I give advice that really gets the deal done. And, um, I know how to balance business needs with business needs with legal advice. Um, so let's, let's jump right in, uh, lease options, you know, what type of lease is it? Uh, I'm assuming that you're going to have kind of a basic bread and butter triple net. Um, this may be a form lease. Um, it, it may be a more custom job. Uh, but at the end of the day, if it's a, uh, commercial real estate lease, it's going to have a lot of language. It's going to have, you know, dozens, 40 pages, um, governing various scenarios and what's important to understand is what is the the type of the lease what type of risk is envisioned to fall on which party um, and i think covid 19 is a very interesting situation because it's not clear who should bear the burden of predicting this type of you know catastrophic uh, impact to the economy so uh, second, you know, who are the parties? Uh, obviously, we have a landlord and we have the tenant, but what type of landlord are they? Are they a small mom and pop top op type of operator? Are they a large national uh, REIT? Uh, I think it's really important to identify who the parties are, and that is how I'm able to effectively negotiate both with my tenants and my landlords to get those lines of communication open and then ultimately coming to a resolution, which is a, a change from the status quo. And I think that's really what my clients are looking for is that communication <coughs> and negotiation process, and then being able to, uh, to negotiate something different. Um, um, so what do I need? You know, whenever clients come to me and, and they say, I had this situation, they're either a landlord or a tenant. I say, what are your own goals? Do you have a smaller strip center, maybe without an anchor tenant, and you need this group or this set of tenants to carry your returns, to carry your debt service, and it's really important to preserve the core uh, people versus, hey, I, I have a very high threshold to hit, um, and maybe that's why I need to... Um, you know, be very, I won't say tough, but, but enforcing the lease terms um, because that's, that's key to my thesis or how I run my investment business. Uh, and once you can identify your own goals, the rest of the process kind of falls in line because you've reduced some of your options. And by reducing the parameters of what you can and can't do, then we can do our best within those parameters to reach those goals. Uh, second, understand your legal rights. You know, a lot of tenants are kind of coming to me saying, well, well, clearly I don't have to pay rent. The, the government has shut me down. They, they've closed me. I, 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 if I can't generate revenue, how am I supposed to pay rent? It's, you know, they sometimes and, and wrongly assume that they have a legal right to not pay rent because the government, because the cities, the counties, uh, state governors, they're acting 
but uh, you know, I, I would I would disagree and say that's that's not actually true. You still have an obligation to pay rent. The condemnation or the government restriction or impossibility clauses or frustration of purpose, those really aren't triggered by again even restaurant closures. For example somebody would tell you well you have this lease you have a kitchen you still have access to a lot of the tools that are available for you to generate revenue you could switch to a, a takeout um, a delivery service and that's still allowing you to generate revenue it's still allowing you access to the space they're not prohibiting um, a hundred percent of businesses from acting so until we we cross that bridge I, I'm, I'm still advising tenants you know you still have a possibility for restaurant tenants, you still have a way to make money. So that said, you know, let's talk about a, a tenant. If you want to be in the best position to approach your landlord and ask for some type of modification from the current rent structure, uh, you know, I suggest everybody prepare these four things. So your track record as a good tenant. Um, if you've only been in the space for a short amount of time, not as good for you. But if you have been in the space for three or four years, um, you've always paid rent, you haven't, not so you haven't complained, but you haven't had complaints against you. Um, you haven't had police disturbances. You haven't um, had unauthorized modifications causing problems. No other tenants have complained about you. That's a track record as a good tenant. And, and I want to see that history from the tenant's point of view of I've paid my rent on time. I've paid my cam. I, I've done all this. I've been cooperative. I'm a good tenant. And I want to see those, those uh, written evidence of being a good tenant. Uh, second is your financial records. So that's, that's a similar vein, but it's kind of a, uh, a subset of this. It's more reflective on your tenant operations. And you might say, hey, we've had this, you know, what is that? I'm, I'm looking at my little pictures, Panda Express. I don't know what they pay in rent, but let's say, you know, they, they're expecting revenues around 75000 a month and they're paying a, uh, a $10,000 a month rent. You want to show that um, through the past T12, you've been generating between 60 and, and 80,000 in revenue. Um, and that's what has fit your business model to pay 10,000 base plus, you know, some cam charges. That is, that makes sense. You know, you have your, your rent costs, you have your employee costs, you have your cogs, you have your food costs, then you have a little bit of profit at the top. That is all logical, and I think it will be persuasive to show you that, boom, that was my last full month of revenue was February, and now we look at March, and March has, has indicated a precipitous decline from 75000 and all the way down to 25000 something like that, and, and, and it just shows how much of a drop, and are we talking a 50% decline, are we talking about a 10% decline, or are we talking about you know, 90%. Um, and, and that's really an important question because a lot of these restrictions or stay in place orders, this did not happen until the middle of March. So the US has gone from zero to 60 in a very, very short amount of time. And for tenants to come to me saying, hey, I don't want to pay my April rent. It was really, um, you know, I had to put on this other hat to say, look, it's really only been two weeks. We don't know um, how the rest of April is going to shake out. So you can't, the landlord's not really entertaining too much of a shift for only two weeks of business disruption in which you still had two weeks to generate revenue um, before. So I, I, I do think that it's really shocking and that this is not a normal recession type environment. This is not a, uh, a, a gradual decline from here's your base, you know, you're 75,000 a month and then you hit 60 and then you hit 55 and then you went up to 65 and then you went down to 50 and then you went to four. It was not a process over many months where the writing was, you know, quote on the wall of this is a recession. We need to buckle down and make changes. This just hit immediately overnight, shut down the restaurant, you know, shut down um, staff and, and, and everything. So it's really unique in that, I think everybody will have a clear, bright line of when the, the stay in place and when the crackdowns occurred. So that said, gather your records. And, and the more that you can show them, then it'll justify what you're asking for from your landlord. So if you had a 50% reduction in income and now we're in April, 
um, and you're trending for what is it first three days of April or the first you know half partial week um, again if you're trending at that 50 percent to me it would be logical to maybe ask for a 50 percent forbearance on on some certain aspects depending on your situation um, that can mean a short-term uh, forbearance and you pick it up on the back end of the lease you also um, could have a you know number four a persuasive plan with numbers and forecasts to catch up on those rent payments so for example um, in, in my Panda Express uh, scenario we had uh, 75,000 and then if it has a 15,000 or ten thousand dollar profit you could put together a plan that says I'm asking for a three month 50% reduction uh, which totals 15,000 and the plan after that would be to catch up once uh, September hits or August hits and then you would pick up August September and October I will forego quote our, our profit location a locations profit to repay that amount of rent that was forgiven during these summer months something like that um, with numbers and forecasts is going to be the best way to speak to the landlord that uh, doesn't present to them that you're just giving up rent and have no plan to recapture it later. Uh, another alternative is uh, we're seeing some landlords willing to say, okay, we'll forego rent, but for every month that we're waiving uh, base rent, we're going to add a month at higher rates at the end of your lease. And so if there are additional corporate guarantees, if there's personal guarantees, we're extending this lease and we're just treating this as kind of a pause. You still have to pay, you know, um, cam expenses, right? I think that one's reasonable. You still have to pay expenses, but um, in terms of that base amount, we could extend it to the back end, and that's a trade-off that the landlord maybe is willing to take. And again, everything depends on your individual situation, your relationship with the landlord, your relationship with the tenant, um, and then also ultimately asking, what do you want? What what is beneficial? You can't just come to me and say, I don't want to pay any rent. I'm 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 shutting down my restaurant. I I don't want to pay any rent. I don't think that's reasonable, and and landlords are not going to be responsive to that type of request. Um, they're going to say, tough luck. You know, you got to keep paying rent, or we're going to evict. Um, so again, key issues of tenants. This kind of summarizes what I talked about: legal rights. Um, understanding what the local orders are, because I do think that we're seeing very different implementations across different cities, counties, states, um, you know, and even different countries, for example. So if you have a tenant in Collin County, they're not under the same restrictions like Dallas County. Um, and it can be confusing or difficult um, I know, again, I'm fielding a lot of questions from more people saying, okay, with this stay at home and non-essential businesses being allowed to operate, say in Collin, A, I have a company based in Collin, so I'm, I'm going to assume we can open our business. Can we serve clients who are in Dallas County because we're allowed to travel? Uh, we're not expecting our clients to move. Or if we have employees who live in Dallas County, are they able to come to work? Can we require them to come to work in Collin County, which is not under the uh, essential businesses only shutdown? And it, it's a huge issue. You know, it's a whole can of worms that there is no easy answer. And I think every business needs to make those uh, decisions based on their own circumstances, working with counsel, talking to other businesses and trying to figure out what do you need to do? Because it's, it's almost impossible to try to figure out where are your employees living? Where are they staying? Um, and a lot of people have concerns that they don't want to be traveling and well, can you penalize them? Can you tell them that they have to come to work be uh, if they're not under a stay at home order? So that's, that's a whole topic for another um, webinar. But you know, back to kind of these landlord tenant issues, the tenants are businesses and, and they are subject to the same problems. So I think documenting what is unique about your particular situation um, and saying we're on the border, a lot of our employees, a lot of our customers are based in Dallas, even though our, our physical space may be in Collin, 
we're going to ask for protections because we're so impacted by the Dallas County restrictions. Something like that is going to be more persuasive and um, to me make a lot more sense. So um, this is a third leg and, you know, unfortunately it's something that we are considering. I mean, uh, I've had this come up more with tenants who are near the end of their lease uh, and they're really considering just kind of walking away. Um, and, you know, your, your reputation or ethics aside, uh, um, I can definitely advise on, on what are the financial ramifications. I can give you a dollar amount that says this is the total amount that they could sue you for. This is what they could go after. Are they going to do it? Does it make sense? Uh, business liability, do you have any corporate guarantors? Do you have any cross-collateralization? Do you have um, other recourse uh, beyond just the, the tenant individual, tenant uh, entity? Also, maybe a personal guarantee, but sometimes too, if, if it's near the end of the lease, it doesn't really matter uh, uh, if there's a person guarantee that it's burned off or they're saying it's such a small amount, uh, they don't think they're going to go after it. And again, we're talking about people that have actually leases expiring in 2020. Um, and they've decided, you know, they, they were on the fence about renewing. They didn't really want to. And now this event has just really pushed them over the edge and said, you know what, we're, we're, we're done. We're just going to uh, not pay. We're going to shut it down. We're already in the winding down stages. Um, so that's interesting to, to really figure out what that top dollar amount and with the courts closed, um, with, with eviction stayed, it's, it's going to be very difficult and a long process for landlords to evict even non-paying tenants. Uh, again, don't be afraid to ask the landlord, you know, things are, go to the people who ask early and, and ask often. I think that the squeaky wheel gets the grease here is really true um, in the sense that later on, people keep saying, you know, we haven't gotten to the worst yet. Um, this, this COVID crisis is going to get worse before it gets better. And I think that's, you know, uh, that's, that's concerning as, as a operator or proprietor of a, of a business, you should be planning and thinking about what are my biggest expenses um, and how can I continue my business um, if this COVID crisis gets worse before it gets better? Um, you know, literally before I hopped on this call, I saw that Dallas County extended a stay at home until May 20th. That is going to affect people, I think, in their rental payments all the way through June and maybe July. Um, that type of severe um uh, lockdown is really going to have an impact on the economy. It's going to have a severe impact on tenants being able to, to pay the previously agreed to uh, rent. And again, I'm not saying you need to change a lot of terms and just, you know, tear up the lease, but you do need to have a communication. You need to have a dialogue and understand very clearly what do you want given your current assumptions and what do you know, what is the impact, the financial impact, based on what has happened so far. Um, and then you can, you can extrapolate and you can predict, but having those two things will really, really give you, I think, a sense of confidence when you're negotiating or talking and saying, look, uh, these are the facts. This is what I want. These are the facts. This is what I think is gonna happen. What can you give me? What, what can we work with? Um, and that's where we've seen the most um, success with landlords willing to say, okay, Let's, let's waive X amount. Let's forbear X amount. I'm not releasing you from it. It's still an obligation to pay, but I'm going to defer that obligation to three months down the road. Something like that, if it's useful, um, can really go a long way. Um, so now I'm, I'm going to kind of switch. Uh, I'm going to put on my landlord hat because I have also uh, been working with a few landlords who have come to me with tenant requests. Um, and it's the same thing. You know, all of this action and all of this legal work um, has has occurred in the month of March. I mean, I, I would say nobody has contacted me since April 1st with somebody. You know, they're probably not even late yet if they have uh, till the 3rd. Nobody has come to me with April. So this was all just preemptive requests where certain tenants saw their business um, you know, potentially being slashed in, in just a few months. 
So, um, hey, Ron. Yes. Hey, um, I was just wondering. So, are most of the issues that you're hearing about like mo mostly in the retail space? Yeah, I, I would say it's it is largely in the retail space, but it's not confined because. Okay. Uh, you know, even just an office uh, where people are struggling with sales, they're struggling with their leads. Um, maybe they haven't been able to transition to work from home. I know that the technology is a big issue. So retail is the leading asset class, but other people that are, that are you know, forward thinking are also bringing it up. Okay, I got you. Um, okay. So again, as, as a landlord, you know, you have a lot of things to think about. Um, you may not have a indication or you may have overestimated the percentage of tenants who are going to pay on time. And when it rolls around to next week, you may be in for a shock of a wake up call with the number of late tenants or non paying tenants. And you'll, you know, again, I think we're going to see a new information of April that says, wow, this tenant had been great for the last five years. I had no idea that, that they were in such a position um, to not pay rent. So again, we'll watch this. And, you know, I'm talking to a lot of different landlords, brokers, and kind of what they're seeing. Um, so we'll see what happens. Really, it's just like another week from now. Uh, contract options, your rights, Obviously, the landlords uh, have have a stronger legal position. I think nothing so far has has completely eliminated the value. They haven't condemned it. They don't. The landlords don't have a government claim, a claim against the government for condemnation, things like that. Um, so they have the upper hand in terms of they enforce it. But at the end of the day, that enforcement is really only as good as the amount that you can collect that you can file a lawsuit, you can move that lawsuit through the courts and obtain a judgment. Um, and then you go collect on that judgment, which is a long process in a good economy. And now we're facing court closures. Uh, you know, courts are closed for 60 days. There's no evictions, there's no writs issued. Um, and that, you know, that applies to commercial or residential um, leasing. Um, litigation is having huge delays in terms of Courts are very generous with continuances. You're not having as many in-person hearings. They're, they're spacing out the hearings, for example. So you don't get this um, gallery of attorneys waiting, right? So they maybe would have six or eight matters set and then all those attorneys would just be waiting um, to go up when they're ready. And now maybe they're cutting into three and spacing everybody out. It's, uh, it's like social distancing for hearings in, in the courthouse. But that's what they're doing. And, and it's just causing things to move a lot slower. Um, and as a landlord, you have to understand that's a long and maybe costly process to, to collect on some of that financial uh, obligation, even if the tenant defaults and they owe you the money. When are you going to see that money? You know, if it was, it was his six to nine months at best before, you're probably a year or two years um, out from doing that because the courts are just, they're going to be hugely backlogged um, when we come out of this. So again, and then the final consideration is really just the dollar and cents. Um, what's the cost to locate and place and sign a new tenant? Uh, the problems that are unique to this tenant are not going to go away if you evict and kick them out of this space. You know, you're still going to have uh, 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 problems with finding new tenants who want that space and want to pay uh, for that uh, for that use. So again, that's just something to consider. Um, I go through kind of the process. This is how we've worked it out. You know, in terms of my practice and our firm, uh, hire a representative. You have to decide: Do you want to try to do something? Uh, gather that information, submit a letter. Uh, a lot of times that's all we need just to open the channels of communication. Um, be clear to the landlord of, of what's going on. Um, give them some insight into your business and then negotiate, get a written agreement. I can't stress that enough as don't just rely on an email from a property manager. Oh yeah, it's fine. You guys can pay late or you can pay later. Um, no, no fees, you know, get it in writing. 
and then perform. You know, I, I think that's the biggest issue now is um, uh, follow through on what you say you'll do on both sides, landlord and tenant. And that's really going to improve relationships in the future. And this is a trying time, but if both sides can, can perform, then it's going to improve that relationship going forward. So um, financing, you know, it, it's always in there. Um, I think that uh, you have to understand that the landlord has a, possibly has a mortgage to pay um, and that's putting pressure on him to collect the rent too. But if the landlord can, can trade down a little bit of his equity return, and again, he doesn't have to disclose what his debt payment is, but he can say, look, I can give you X, but that's the most haircut that I can give you because I still have bills to pay as well. Um, and that's the kind of communication that, again, I think we, we should be aware of it and know that the people with bad debt um, are going to be in a weaker position um, and ultimately maybe harder for you to negotiate versus uh, people with good debt. So just a factor, just a consideration. You can also landlords reach out to your lenders. There's a lot of uh, opinions going around on whether we should ask for forbearance and the evictions and, you know, multifamily and, and different uh, asset classes have different options depending on who their lenders are and who's holding that note. Um, but again, that's, that's kind of a, another issue. So um, again, you know, I, I want to open this up to questions. Um, I have my contact, feel free to shoot an email. Uh, I am going to record this and, and throw the PowerPoint um, to everyone who reached out for the meeting. I'll put it on my YouTube channel. Um, I'm posting a lot more content now that's, uh, yeah, stuff like this that I hope is useful. So does anyone have questions about situations? Um, yeah, actually, have you heard anything about, have you heard anything like from any lenders or anything like that? Like, are, are they getting, you know, affected by this at all? Like, are they not wanting to lend money and stuff like that? Or it does it not really matter? Um, I, I've heard both. Um, so I've heard that some lenders are restricting, but their, their terms are still the same. I mean, their underwriting is still the same. They're just putting a little bit of a pause on, on actual outflow to decide whether they need to make an adjustment. Um, but, you know, I've had, I've seen, I've heard two deals that, that went sideways that, you know, they wouldn't, they weren't able to close because of the lender. Um, okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely impacting if it's a thin deal to start with, so. Okay. But you think if it's, I mean, if it's a strong deal, like head to toe, I mean, you shouldn't have an issue. You don't think so? Yeah, I, I mean, people are still gonna put the money out. I mean, especially this low interest rate environment, you can, you can probably put um, a lower LTV that can make the lender feel more comfortable. Um, but your total debt service isn't going to go up. I think that's, that's a counter counterbalance, you know, but, um, so like on the commercial side, I don't know if people have more insight in this, but we saw rates actually go up a little bit when the fed dropped it to zero. And that was kind of odd. It's like, well, it should have gone down, but it was kind of like the signal that the fed was so scared that this was such a bad economy that the banks were saying, whoa, wait a minute, let's, uh, let's pull back a little bit. Um, and this is, you know, in the low threes for commercial debt now. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if nobody else has questions, again, thank you guys for joining. I hope, hope this provided a little bit of insight. Again, it's still rapidly evolving. I think that um, from my source of, of potential clients or leads who are contacting me. Um, it's just going to see whether that pipeline gets bigger or smaller. Um, but it's definitely something that everyone should be aware of. Um, it's something I didn't talk about is, is you know, force majeure. Um, I, I really rarely see that in any commercial leases. And that's basically a clause which says if something totally unpredictable and, and crazy happens, um, it'll allow both sides to terminate the lease and neither has any obligation going forward. So no obligation to pay rent and no obligation to provide the space. 
Um, very rarely are those in commercial leases, um, but those are being exercised in a lot of other situations, so like manufacturing and other service contracts. Um, anybody who has uh, big performance, you know, manufacturing, transportation agreements, they're saying, okay, we're just completely getting out of this. We don't see that in the commercial real estate space, so it's not, um, I would say, as common of an option. I have seen it, you know, maybe like once or twice on a, on a purchase agreement, but uh, yet to be seen whether people are exercising those and whether that exercise will be held up in court, right? That's, that's always two parts to the coin is, yes, you may exercise it, but if the other party doesn't agree with your interpretation, they can file a lawsuit and say, well, we'll let the judge decide if this is truly uh, a situation covered by force majeure. Um, so anyway, if you guys see that clause, I'm sure you're, you're seeing that buzzword, but that's really what it means and, and how it's not generally applicable for commercial real estate. I mean, we just don't see it. So. Uh, what about in the, uh, in the multifamily space? Have you, have you talked to any landlords that have had like tenants trying not to pay rent or anything? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's a, it's a huge problem. So we actually talked about this more. I did a webinar yesterday on distressed real estate and we, we had a multifamily expert on there. Um, okay. It's definitely more of an issue on multifamily. And what you have is let's say a very high physical occupancy and you have this catch 22 problem of all these tenants are not paying rent and simultaneously uh, you can't evict them. So it's almost impossible for the landlord to get, you know, out from under this problem because they can't evict the tenants and they can't get paying tenants in the building because there's no more yeah. physical space to get them. So they have to ask for the forbearance, but the forbearance brings with it eviction moratoriums. As well. And so it's a real sticky problem that I think is going to lead to some undercapitalized owners, you know, short sale or you know distressed asset sales because um again the, the the features of this crisis are not like a normal recession i would say a normal recession sure you still have a a, a tipping point but you see a gradual decline so if you have a multifamily building um you see two or three percent evictions and okay you see a five percent pop and then you know you're still getting rent you're still collecting 80 percent of your normal rent and then you have 10% evictions, and then you have another 15% of late payments. You get all these warning signs, and it allows you cash flow. It allows you time. You know, during the worst recession, we don't have eviction moratoriums. Uh, and so you're able to cycle out those non-paying tenants and, you know, gradually reduce your physical occupancy to, say, 60%. Um, and then there's an opportunity to, to do that. So, yeah, multifamily, it's a whole nother topic but it's a it's a huge problem okay was there was there any um like was you know class a like more so than like section eight or anything or was it pretty no, much I the same think so. i think it's workforce you know b and c is in general yeah yeah okay i got you okay i mean that's all the questions i have but. yeah all right well thanks guys um i don't want to hold you it's friday afternoon so everyone be safe and uh i will share this info out there